Perfect. Um, so basically, how does an agent work? Like for, for this age of player, um, like obviously they're not signing NHL contracts or anything like that. Um, so how does it work, the agent-player relationship with the parents at this, at this age? Yeah, so I think, you know, for us, there's a couple different things that we want to help the players with. Obviously, the focus at this age is the Western League draft and helping families, you know, sort through all of that, talking to the teams, helping the parents and the, with any questions that they have. But it's also then about that long term of, well, helping them decide what route they're going to go. Is it going to be the Western League? Is it going to go be that BCHL, NCAA path? And it, again, if your goal as a player is to one day be that guy who's signing that NHL contract, how are you going to get there? And what's the best path for you? And that's, I think, the biggest thing we look at is trying to look at each player as an individual. And just because the Western League was a great route for one guy doesn't mean it's the great route for the other guy. And it's not about the Western League versus the NCAA or anything like that. It's just about what's the right path for you as a player. The other thing that we spend a lot of time with as an agency is, you know, especially when you're starting to work with kids who are 14, 15 years old, is how can we help you get better? You know, you might between, if you're a kid who plays, you know, Bantam, major midget and then makes junior as a 16 year old you could have three four different coaches in three four years and so of course they're doing what they can for you and they want to help you but your agency might be the one constant in terms of a through line through those three four years so making sure that you're continuing to develop and continuing to get better so that you don't just make the western league you have success in the western league right you don't just make pro hockey but you're going to have success there what types of things um either your agency or in general agencies, what sort of, besides the, like, I mean, along with guidance, what sort of like ways can an agent help a young athlete and his family navigate the waters, like whether it's camps or, or advice or, or that sort of things. Yeah. So, I mean, camps is a big one for sure. Right. Just having the, getting all the guys together and being able to hopefully bring in some high level coaches or speakers or whatever it is that, they need and I think it is it's helping players to understand and families to understand you know what got you success at the bantam level might not be enough to have success at midget or in junior and so just again in terms of that information side of things we're big on helping guys to start to understand what you need to do with mental performance what do you need to do in terms of nutrition and all those different things and then as our players get older and what they need gets more and more specialized it could be connecting them with you know maybe the best skills coach for them is a guy based out of minnesota or calgary or whatever it is and so it's again it's just always looking for each individual player like what does that guy need right now to take that next step and how can we provide that and i think a big part of that more and more is on that mental performance side as well you know especially when guys are going to junior for the first time you know you could be living away from home for the first time you know you're a healthy scratch for the first time in your life and those are tough things for guys to go to and so just being able to be there for them on that side of things to make sure that you know they're still they're seeing the big picture and continuing to stay on track uh, I, I'm obviously a big fan of the mental side of things and kids players really focusing on that side because you know everyone's got a skills coach, everyone's got a trainer, everyone does that. And the, uh, sort of the area where you could probably make the most gains, I think, is in that mental side of the game. So is there anything you can expand on that, either what you offer, whether it's books or speakers or counseling or sports psych or, or whatnot that you can offer um, these guys? Yeah, so we do have a mental performance coach on staff. His name's Derek Stone. He's actually, he's based out of Edmonton, but he works with, you know, any of our guys in in Western Canada that need it. And it's, you know, with the mental performance stuff, it's so personal to each player, to each person that if you, you know, so with Derek, if someone's looking for that type of support, we get them in touch with Derek. And most times it's a fit, but if it's not, you're right, we'll find them someone else. And it's, it's just about trying to figure out what works for you. There's some guys who they can be on the first line, they can be on the fourth line, and it doesn't matter, right? Their approach is the same. Their confidence is the same. They're just really solid that way. And some, but for most of us, I would say, right, you know, if you had a good game, you're going to feel better. If you had a tough game, you're going to feel a little worse. And same with all that. So it's just about, it gets into trying to be more about the process than the results, right? We've all had a game where you had a great game, 
but you didn't score any goals, right? You didn't whatever put up any points. We've all had tough games, but you scored two goals, right? It just kind of happened. And so it's about being more aware of the the process. And if you've got the right process in terms of your game prep, in terms of your practicing, in terms of what you're doing in the games, it can be hard to believe sometimes when you're in those tough spots, but the results will start to take care of themselves. You know, if you're doing all the right things, like you're coaching, nine times out of 10, you're going to start getting more ice time eventually, get more opportunities, start to put up points. But if you're living and dying with every shift, you know, who got to go on the power play, how many goals did I score? That's where it can really become that, that mental roller coaster for guys. For sure. Um, sticking with the WHL for now, I mean, obviously with COVID and all that, we're not sure what's happening with camps. Uh, what I've heard is they're starting – September 1st if everything is still get going going better at that time um, for the guys that are free agents any advice for looking for camps uh, WHL camps uh, which which camp to go to and whatnot yeah absolutely I think if you are you know you in some ways if you're that free agent player who now has whatever five six seven invites or once the invites come out if you have five six seven invites then there's, an, there's a bit of an advantage to that. And so do your homework. I mean, if you're a forward and that team had a ton of picks and took six forwards this year versus a team that had very few picks and only took one or two guys, you know, that might be the, the place to go just because of the opportunity there. You know, if you, the, again, it's, as I always tell guys, it, it's your career. So you can put as much or as little you know, thought into these decisions as you want, but if, see if they've got any success with undrafted guys. You know, what is their track record for developing players? I mean, I would just encourage guys to do that homework and to figure out where that fit is. If their teams are calling you, you know, don't be afraid to ask some questions. You know, see how, how much they know about you, how much of a fit you could be for them, and really just put the time in to make that best decision. Because, again, if you get that uh, decision right and you find a good team that lists you, within a year – you could be in just as good a position as a guy who was a fifth, sixth, fourth round pick. For sure. Um, during the season when you're at games, is that, you know, I'm sure it's a combination of watching your current clients and you're also obviously always looking for clients. So I, I don't want to be too general because I hate when I get asked general questions, but when you're looking for clients, what specific things do you notice or do you like that you want to take on as a potential client? For sure. And I think, you know, the older they are, I think the more specific you can get, you know, if you're looking at players who are in junior hockey, who are in college hockey, yeah, you're looking for guys who can have the skills that can transfer directly to the pro game. But at the younger ages, like Bantam, I mean, the you guys are still so young, you've got so much time to develop. Yeah, you know, I'm really looking for that those foundational skills. And for me, those would be skating, it would be hockey sense, and it would be work ethic. If a player's got a strong command of what's going on on the ice, if he, it, you know, if his skate, and again, measuring the player's skating, it's going to be different what you're looking for in a 5'6 kid versus a 6'2 kid. But right, if, if for what they want to be able to do on the ice, if they're able to, to get there and do those. efficiencies that player has in his game at your guys' age you've all got things that you need to work on but you just know that guy is going to put in the work because again for us we've got a lot of tools that can help our players just like your coaches do but it's ultimately the guys who are putting in the work so those are the three that I'm looking for thanks uh, you cut out a bit there but I think we got the, the gist of it or at least you cut out for me um just just to backtrack one step to the to the WHL camps um, there's obviously a lot of information out there about keeping your NCAA eligibility. And, and I've experienced a lot of things where parents are like, whoa, 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 we're not staying another day or we'll lose it. And I'm like, well, no one's asking you to sign a contract. Can you sort of spell out sort of the, what specifically as far as NCAA eligibility in regards to attending a WHL camp, 48 hour rule and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So the 48 hour rule is you know, essentially that you can 
be at one of these camps for 48 hours if you're you know on the team's the team's dime without your eligibility coming into the question but for a lot of players especially the undrafted guys if you guys are paying your own way and you're paying for your hotel room and all those things you know you can be there for for a while and still be fine and ter- the, the one thing that a lot of guys get hung up on is the stuff they get sent the hats and the hoodies well can i accept it can i not and yes i mean it's it is it starts to get into the the ncaa's you know are those impermissible benefits what i can say is if the ncaa path is something that you guys are interested in and the team wants to send you a hoodie send you a hat you can get your parents to ask to pay for those things and to have that receipt and then you're completely covered if and when an ncaa question comes up but you know in terms of just avoiding those things altogether what i usually recommend and you've seen some of it over the last couple days and there's nothing wrong with it but if the ncaa isn't interested a path you're interested in then you probably shouldn't be on social media posting hey thanks whoever for the free hat and the free hoodie that's awesome because those that's the type of stuff that the ncaa is looking for but it is it's definitely it's good to be aware of the ncaa rules but i think overall parents are are too worried about it you know these these whl teams aren't trying to trick you into losing your eligibility you know the ncaa's organizations aren't the ncaa's organization isn't trying to catch you in the act like it's just you know they want amateur athletes going through the ncaa and they want people making sure that they're you know following those rules thanks um anything can you just touch on the new the new rules as far as recruiting for ncaa that they established uh this season and obviously it would change for for this age group because some guys might have been committed already at 14 years old. And and can you talk about some of those changes they made as far as recruiting and signing letters and and contact and that type of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So they've now pushed back the age that these teams can start to reach out to you. The reason being is with, with, especially in the States, right, with no draft like the Western League has, colleges were just starting to commit to kids younger and younger and younger. And so they wanted to clean that up. And so now it's, you know, that grade 10 year where they can officially start reaching out to to families and players and showing their interest. And so I think the biggest challenge for families out here in Western Canada is, you know, you got to be, if you want to go that NCAA path, you got to be committed to it because it's going to take a little bit longer than going the western league i mean as you guys have already seen there's guys who were drafted a couple weeks ago who are already signing and getting no they're not gonna be on the team right away but at least they have that commitment from that team whereas if you're going the ncaa path you know it's going to be a bit of a longer road it's you might not make the bchl for example until you're 17 you might not get that commitment till you're 18 19 and again there's nothing wrong with that but it's just if that's a road that you're starting to look down i think you just got to be prepared that's going to take a little bit longer and these these rules reflect that that they don't want guys committing at 13 14 anymore and how does how do you become involved with that ncaa because i know it's um you know it's not like there's scouts everywhere for ncaa teams it's just basically the assistant coaches how does that work i know some of it is just the play the the assistant coaches go out see a guy they like they make contact they go from there like how how does someone like you get involved in a player going from playing on a BCHL team to receiving a, a, a scholarship offer? And, and how does someone like you do that? And how does it sort of, how does the whole process happen for those players and those athletes? Yeah, absolutely. So for, you know, thankfully for all you guys, we've got the BCHL right in our backyard and it's one of the top junior A leagues in North America. And so it's a little bit easier here than maybe some other provinces because these teams are motivated to come here and try to find players from the BCHL. Having said that, as your coach just said, there's you know, two, three, maybe four assistant coaches on an NCAA staff. And within that, the hockey season, they're coaching their own team, right? Practices, games, and then they're flying to BC. They're flying to the USHL into Alberta to see as many teams as they can over a two, three day stretch and then flying back. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I think being a NCAA assistant coach is one of the most demanding coaching positions you can have because you're trying to, rec- you don't have a scouting staff as, as Leland said. And so that provides opportunity for advisors like myself, because I mean, these teams will tell you that 
guys can slip through the cracks. They're not going to be able to see every player in the BCHL the way they would want to over the course of the season. And so for us, when we're talking to those teams, it's, you know, they're, they're ongoing conversations, but you know, okay. So for this upcoming year, if they're looking at players in the 2000, 2001 age groups, well, what positions do you need? A couple forwards, a defenseman, a goalie, but like what types of players do you need? Is it a right shot D man? Is it a playmaking center? Like we really get into the specifics about what they're looking to add to the roster. And then for us, we then have conversations with them, with the players we work with that fit what they're looking for. Because again, at the, the thing about the NCAA level is playing the BCHL. Of course you want to get on the best team, get on the right fit, but you know, you I mean, you can get traded. If things aren't working out, you can move in the NCAA. You don't have that opportunity. You know, you're, you commit to that team and that's that's where you're playing for the next four years and so we really put in the time just to make sure that fit is there assuming that those conversations are going well it's sending video clips of not, not a highlight reel but right a couple clip of their shifts from a couple games sending that to them transcripts you know, just whatever they need to go about making those decisions and then the the teams are going to start to do their homework they're going to call your coaches they're going to call other people that they know within the league to try to get a feel for you and then but then that last step is ge generally them coming out and watching you play live you know most of these teams they want to be able to see a player in person they can only they feel they can only get so much from video but it's just trying to get these guys everything they can to, to help make that decision now can you just touch on a bit you mentioned transcripts there like how much um when those discussions start happening are, are they interested in grades and, and how much does that matter at that ncaa level so Absolutely. I mean, they're looking for the best hockey players they can. So as long as you can get into the school, that's what they're concerned about. So if you, but, you know, in terms of what that means for each individual school is all over the place. Some programs have, you know, a lot of leeway on what grades they can get into a, their school. Some have very, very little. And so, you know, just as an example, I had a player this year who had a very, very interested division one program and they took one look at his transcripts and like he his grades aren't good enough to get in here can't do it and that was it end of discussion right there's no getting around that and so you know we were able to ultimately get that player a scholarship to a division one team but i'll be honest it was it, it became wh what's the best hockey fit for you to which school can you get into and that's not what you want to have and so the better your grades can be again it's ultimate you know the hockey ability is the number one thing, but it's just, it's the worst when there's an opportunity on the table and it's just gone because of the grades. Cause there's just, especially if you're a 19, 20 year old, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. When, um, when a verbal offer is made and accepted by a, a school and a student, what does that mean and what can happen between then and a possible uh, letter of intent being signed? Like, like, do you know, you know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's, it's a question we get a lot from, from families because with that verbal commitment, you know, how strong is that? Well, what I can tell you is these teams are not just throwing out verbal commitments left and right. If they're giving you that verbal commitment, it's because they intend on having you on that team, but it, nothing's official until you sign that letter of intent. And so you, can you lose that? You can, but it's not going to be because of maybe what guys think of right away. It's going to be because if you get that verbal commitment and all of a sudden your plays in the tank, or they're starting to get really bad feedback from your coaches, or if you're young enough that you're still in school and your grades fall off and you can't get into that school anymore. It's, you know, the way I would describe it to the players is it's, you have the commitment now, but it's yours to lose. And so as long as you continue to do the right things and produce and everything, you know, you should be fine. But if those, if for whatever reason you start to, there start to be some red flags, then you're, you're absolutely you're putting that verbal commitment into question. Uh, can you talk to us a bit, uh, switching over to, actually, let's stay on NCAA. So once that player gets on campus, what are some of the challenges as a freshman specifically have you encountered, uh, encountered with some of your clients? Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, before you were, if you were in the BCHL, you know, you were a little away from home, but now you're potentially really far away from home. I mean, on the other side of the continent, 
you're, depending on when you went, you've had a couple years off from school. It's a big campus plus hockey training camp. Like it's just, it's a lot all at once. And so again, tying it back to where you guys are at right now, it's the guys who had good study habits in high school who were able to just, I call it be a professional and take care of what they needed to take care of school, hockey, all those things. If you build those habits now, then the transition to college, you know, will be a little bit easier for you. But if you don't have any of those habits, then yeah, it can be a real tough, real tough transition. And it is, it's guys think when they think about going to school, they think about the, the hockey part. They don't think about the school part. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot all at once. And so I think, knowing that as well. I mean, understand how many classes you need to take to be eligible. And maybe you only take that many classes instead of a full schedule that first semester, you know, just doing, we'll talk about to guys about doing things like that, just to make that initial transition a little bit easier for you. And whether it's with your advisor, whether it's with your new coaches, your parents, whoever it is, if that transition is going tougher, like you got to tell somebody, right? It's, I always tell the guys, you know, I can't help if I don't know what's going on. And so it is, it's a big transition, but again, if you've been at the same time as playing hockey and going to school, which is something that you guys are, are doing now and are going to be doing for a while. Uh, can you talk a bit about WHL uh, contracts? Um, I know, I think they all know that it's, you know, for every year of school or every year they play, they get a year of school. I know there's been some adjustments in that where some players have been I think, signing more than one year guaranteed when they first uh, yep. sign. Talk about some of those adjustments and what sort of just a, a basic of what, what that means and what a WHL contract might look like. For sure. And so, yeah, as Leland said, now teams can guarantee up to three years, those first three years up front. And they've also now as a, if you sign as a 15 or a 16 year old, you, you can't be traded. And so they've definitely put some things in there to add some stability to it. And I think to, you know, frankly, the, if, if you're a family who's looking NCAA versus WHL, you know, that academic package now is, is very, very comparable. And so that's, that's the basic, basic outline. But I mean, the rest of it in there is honestly getting into what the team expects of you guys in terms of work ethic, in terms of, you know, what are the things that could get you to lose your spot on the team or to lose your scholarship? So it does, it lines out, you know, those different things. And then on the team side, it gets into, you know, what they're going to do for you guys in terms of support academically, in terms of support, um, in terms of, you know, the money you get per month to help when you're on the road per diem it's called and just all those types of things. But it's, they are, you know, they are, they're pretty basic, but it is, tying it back to the NCAA, I mean, if, if you sign that contract, then you're, you're committing yourself to the Western League route. Um, I know this is a long way away for a lot of these kids, but if, but, and I know the parents would be more interested in this, but can you talk a bit about youth sports and, uh, you know, if, if, you know, you don't go on to pro hockey when you're 20 or 19 coming out of the WHL, can you talk about any clients you've had that have played youth sports and what that looks like. And I, I don't know, I, this is my opinion. I, I think it's an awesome league that nobody goes and watches, unfortunately, especially in Western Canada. Um, but I think there's something to be said about playing four years in WHL and then being able to go to UBC or McGill or, or U of A or U of S or something like that. Can you talk about any of the clients you've had possibly that have gone to youth sports or just your, your thoughts on the youth sports and, and what, that, what that sort of life career and then possible career post youth sports could be? Absolutely. I mean, I think the you, I completely agree with what you said there, Leland. I think it's a very underrated league that's come a long way. I mean, now, you know, maybe 10 plus years ago, if the guys who were playing U sports were coming out of the Western League and say, yeah, I'm going to play some hockey while I get my degree and then, you know, go on from there. But now guys are going to U sports with the intention to continue their hockey careers and to yeah, get some schoolwork done and then try to go pro afterwards and so it is it's a, it's a very good league and in terms of the quality of schools it's true I mean when everyone thinks they think well maybe I'll go NCAA without look really thinking about what the schools might be and in Canada we're very fortunate that like McGill UBC those schools you mentioned are great schools too and so it is it's, it's a really good option and what we're honestly seeing more and more is 
if you're looking at guys, if guys can obviously get NHL contracts or jump right into the American League out of the WHL, they'll take those opportunities. But if it's really just like an East Coast Hockey League contract that they're being offered, more and more guys are going to school instead. And so it is. It's, you look at a team like the U of A, I mean, they've had a number of American Hockey League players, American Hockey League contracts get signed, they had an NHL contract get signed last year out of, out of there. So, I mean, it's, it's a real league. And it, it is. It's thankful that it really can extend your career if you ter- choose to go that Western League route. So, no, it's, it is. It's, it's a great option. Um, being inside this Bantam to midget to junior to college uh, age group for you, what sort of – what can you talk about some of the mistakes that the young athletes have made, either, either thinking, some, thinking the wrong way or acting the wrong way or playing the wrong way? Or can you just talk about the ones that haven't made it? What are some of the – key flags that came up with them not being able to make either the transition from midget to junior or the transition from junior to college and what some of those things have gone through those adversity and how they've handled it and some of the I guess just some of the mistakes that have been made throughout the years for sure so I think there's there's three things that jump to mind when you say that Leland the first is having your mind made up on what path you're going to take too early and so you know I'll talk to families all the time like say this the 06 age group right with now who's starting to look towards that Western League draft a year away and there's families who have already got their mind made up well I'm a Western League we're a Western League family or I'm an NCAA guy or whatever it is and you're, you're saying those things but having no idea about you know what the who's going to draft you what the opportunities are going to be like whatever it is and so you know there's tons of opportunity with both routes but I think the more especially early on that you can keep your mind open to what the possibilities are, the better chance you're going to have of finding that spot that's best fit for you. And that's really what it should be about is just what's the best fit for you as an individual. So I think that's a big one. So they'll have, I've seen guys have great, great Western league opportunities and they just didn't take it. Cause again, they just had that mindset of I'm an NCAA guy or vice versa. And, and it's, so you gotta, you gotta look at those types of things. You know, I think, think the second piece is that mental performance part of it and just starting to, you know, wrap your head around what it's going to look like at some point, you're going to hit a level where, you know, if you're a top player right now, you're going to hit a level where everyone was that top guy. And maybe that's for junior for you. Maybe that's not till the pros, whatever it is, but you're going to hit that level and you just, got to be ready for that and that's a big one I see with junior hockey is guys who have been that go-to guy basically their whole lives and they get to the western league and now they're not and they're facing that adversity and they just don't know how to handle it and so it's and it's 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 some stuff it's hard to go through it until you go through it but you just have to even just being aware that that could happen and that there's going to be ups and downs and just preparing yourself for that you know is a huge piece and I think that third piece is even, you know, I, a lot of guys won't take a hard look at themselves or a hard look at their game until things aren't going the way they hope. And I just think as a player, you got to be your heart, your own harshest critic and like, look at the things you're doing. I mean, talk to your coach about what should I be working on? And if you're a fourth line guy, four, first line guy, it doesn't matter. But because of, for a lot of high end young kids, again, there's things in your game that you need to work on, but you're able to get away with it in Bantam or get away with it with midget and then you're going to hit a level where you can't get away with it anymore and now you're trying to fix it on the fly and it's tough it's very tough to do to be in that type of situation so you know it's don't be afraid to ask your coaches you know what do i need to do better what can i work on and then work on those things because if you're doing all of those things again it doesn't mean you're going to be it's guaranteed to work out but now you're really in my opinion putting yourself in a position to have success um can you talk about I mean, I've experienced a lot when I coached E15 and then from Bantam to that, that adjustment to becoming a 15-year-old midget. And I've seen a lot of players blossom because some, some might not be the best Bantam players, but they end up being awesome once they get to midget and they're getting listed by dub teams or they're getting playing right in the BCHL. Can you talk about that midget year, whether you're playing I guess, E15, I guess U16 now, or you make the jump right to U18? Some of the things that can happen to players – you know, blossoming later and, and, and the, you know, 
what that looks like, you know, because everyone's so focused in Bantam prep. These guys are good. These players are average. These players are not very good. And then that sort of all gets a little bit thrown out the window and, and guys that maybe were awesome in Bantam don't, don't progress. And guys that, you know, we're, we're not really big name guys in Bantam all of a sudden become guys. I mean, we've had a lot of success with that BWC with Crookshanks and DeJong's and, and guys like that. But can you talk a bit about that, that 15 year old year and what, what needs to be the focus? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, Leland's absolutely right. It's because of the Western League draft and just it happening so young, it, it I think in certain, yeah, it throws off what people think about development. And they're now looking at these, you guys as, not as finished products, but they're starting to put players into, into boxes already in terms of this is what they are. And so it's, but you can't worry about those things. It's just, it gets back to that development and the work ethic and having the right process to have success. And in terms of whether it's league 15 or now the U16, it's, it's a conversation that we have with families every single year. Like every, just using the old terminology, everyone wanted to play midget prep and they were almost not insulted, but they were, they weren't happy when they were offered that elite 15 spot. And it, that league was, in my opinion, severely underrated by families, not by scouts or coaches, but by families. And if you are a player who, you know, it could be the best thing for you to go to that elite 15 level, now U16, and to, you know, have, yes, a couple of the top guys from your age are going to go up to the midget prep, but you're going to now be the chance to be the guy, to be on the power play, to have the puck on your stick a ton. And like, those are skills that you just, you can't be a depth guy or like bantam midget right all the way through and then expect to be ready to take on a big role on a junior team and so you need to, there's nothing wrong with your path going a little bit slower it's it's pretty hard for you to move too slowly it's very easy to go too quickly and when again when parents or, or families are focused on the midget prep right as a 15 year old they're just thinking midget prep. They're not thinking, okay, well, what if you're a fourth liner and you're getting seven minutes a night or the seventh defenseman or whatever it is. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with going to a level where you're going to play a ton and you're going to get a chance to get better and produce. And it can, again, when you talk about those guys who the narrative can change very quickly in a positive way, a lot of those guys are players who went through the elite 15. You know, I had a guy out of Alberta, so he wasn't playing academy. He was playing minor midget out there, but was I mean he was he was a draft pick a couple of years ago as a, he was a sixth round pick thought he should have made major midget made minor midget was disappointed family's disappointed and I just told them you know you gotta if if you think not that you're too good but if you feel you're in the wrong spot like show everybody well he you know led the minor midget league in scoring and had AJHL teams and then the or the WHL team that had drafted him everyone was all over him all over him. And so you can absolutely get everything you need to out of those, those leagues for sure. Um, now attending BCHL camps, obviously there's no spring camps this year, but the path is, you know, go to a spring camp, hopefully get invited to main camp or hopefully make the all-star game at the spring camp, uh, then go to main camp. And then can you talk about a bit once, if you get to that BCHL main camp, what it might look like and what they might need to expect and, and, and how to how to go about sort of getting your name, having them react want want you as part of their stable of potential players to to recruit for the BCHL team. For sure, no, it's a uh, BCHL spring camps are tough. I mean, there could be full, anywhere from say like four to six teams of players thrown together for like three days, and you've got whatever it is, four or five ice sessions to try to stand out amongst all those guys. You know, obviously it's a bit discombobulated. Everyone's playing tryout hockey. It's not like everyone, you know, everyone's playing a little selfish. So it's tough. It's tough. But you do. You need the simplest answer is you have to stand out, right? You have to give these guys in the stands, the coaches and the scouts, a reason to notice you. And when people, you know, they think about scoring goals with that, yeah, that, that can be part of it. But big, even like big hits, just you know, a relentless forecheck, being agitating in front of the net. Like, just you got to be doing things to try to stand out and try to separate yourself. And it's 
again, not easy on the mental side, but you can't go in nervous. If it takes you two, three days to get comfortable and start playing your game, well, you only got two, three days. <laughs> and so then by then the camp's over. And so it's, you got to go in with that mindset that I'm going to make an impact. And whatever that is for you, right? It's going to depend on the type of player you are. You don't want to play outside of yourself and try to do too much because then you're going to make mistakes and that's not good either. But just whatever you are as a player, like just bring the best version of that. And if you're able to do those things and stand out, like these, these guys are looking for players. But if you, if you just kind of blend in for three days, you know, you, you defer to other players, you're not doing anything to stand out. It's just there's, you're going to get lost in the wash. And now uh, I think the BCHL, maybe uh, you can expand on this, has made changes as far as committing to players for the following year. I know there's some sort of thing they sign or something now. Can you talk about maybe the process of being a midget player, being offered a commitment to a BCHL team for the following year, what that looks like, maybe what this sort of letter thing they have, I think they've started recently and what that looks like. Yeah. And so, you know, for both the NCAA and the BCHL, you know, I get asked all the time, when are, when do, when do teams commit? And there's no firm answer with that. It's they're going to commit to you once they, they're convinced that you're the player who can help their team. And so for the beach BCHL specifically, I, some of those players, teams will start having at least, you know, very serious conversations with early could be as early as 15 you know, from, I would say that majority of guys, you know, at 16, you start to get yourself on the radar. You need to get AP to get in some games. And then you're looking to make the BCHL that 17 year old year. And there's, in terms of commitments, I say there's three tiers. There's the, you know, the guy who gets that commitment early in a 16 year old year, you know, let's say around Christmas, there's the kids that have to go to, you know, they've got some interest. They go to a couple spring camps and hopefully they get a commitment there. And then the third tier is the guys who are really having a fight in main camp for one of those last three spots. And so you can get committed to, you know, at any of those times. And in terms of the letter they're now having the kids sign, again, it's, it's a new thing and it's still evolving, but it's, it's similar to what they have in other provinces. It's called, like basically a letter of intent. And so they're now signing you to – they can only sign so many players to a letter of intent, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're guaranteed to be on the team. And so it's, it is something to keep in mind when you're looking at, you know, some of these different organizations and the way I describe a BCHL commitment is if they commit to you, that means that, you know, day one of training camp, you're in the top 12 forwards on the depth chart. You're in the top six defensemen. You're in the top two goalies, but it's now, you know, your job to keep that spot. And to fit, because if a guy just walks on to the main camp and just complete right, just outworks you, outproduces you for the entire entire camp, you're, you're making this decision harder on the coaches. And so, it's definitely you would rather be the guy starting in the top twelve than the guy outside of it. But it's yeah, I mean these teams will be upfront about it. They're looking for the best players they can, and that commitment is in their mind a commitment both ways. They're committing to you, but they're committing to the best version of you and the version they expect of you. If that makes sense. Yeah, I like I like that day one of training camp. You're in the top twelve, and you got to hold your spot. I like that mindset. I like that's interesting. I wrote it down. Um, for for that player in BCHL, we touched on a bit or WHL, and you're going through adversity. You think the coach hates you, or you you were told you're playing the top whatever, and you're not, and you're mad, and you you either want to get traded or you want to go home or you're sad or you're homesick or you're whatever. Uh, and you're dealing with this adversity for you. At what point do you want that player to call you? And then at what point do you sort of wrap around and call the coach or, or what, like what sort of types of situations like that have you gone through in your, with, with different clients and what's your sort of advice of, of those things happening? For sure. And yeah, I mean, that's, stuff that happens all the time right you know it's generally not always but generally the homesick is tied to the playing time right if you're if everything's great you're playing a ton and you like all the boys then you know it's usually going pretty well but for uh, in terms of when do I want my players to reach out to me with that stuff right away I mean let's talk about it doesn't mean that we're going to have some big solution right off the bat but 
again, I tell my guys all the time, I can't help with things if I don't know what's going on. And so let's have those conversations and let's see what's going on. If it's a, an ice time issue, right? You're not happy with your role in the team. I mean, in a feeling, you made me laugh. It's like, well, you know, the coach doesn't like me, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it would, what I tell guys too is like these coaches, they really don't care like the name on the back of the jersey. They just want the best players in the best positions. And if you feel that you're not in the right position for what you you deserve, have you actually gone to talk to your coach? And the answer 99% of the time is no, I haven't. And again, you don't go in there and be like asking about like, I want more ice time, but just go, hey, coach, what can I do to help the team win? Like what pointers do you have for me? Like whatever, we're 20 games into this season. What are you seeing from me? What do you need to see more from me? What can I do? before practice like what extra work can I do but go to the coach and have that conversation and most guys just don't do it and I get it like I no one likes being in their head coach's office right having to go talk to him you don't have to I understand it but you can just start that dialogue with them because it very well may be that there's some real actionable things that you can be working on and if there are great if not then you know we can continue to look for solutions but even just from a you know, your coaches are people too, right? They're going to have different relationships with them. So if having that dialogue and opening that, having that relationship with your coach, like there's nothing wrong with that. If still, so that would be usually what I encourage players to do first. If we're still not really getting there, you know, I'll start to really dig into video or go to the games myself and start watching. And, you know, for me, I'm just, if you're not getting the ice time you want, we're just trying to find what the solution is, if there is a solution. And if, you know, one op one option is that yeah, you're playing amazing, and your coach is just sandbagging you. We, and if that is, we can try to address it. But a lot of times too, you go, you talk to the coach, and it's like, well, he's not back checking hard enough, or he doesn't understand our defensive scheme, or whatever the issues are. And then you go watch the game, and your coach isn't wrong, right? There are those things you need to work on. So at that point, we can then work with your coach and work with you to start addressing those things. And so it's just it's problem solving, but you know, pulling the shoot and going home or demanding a trade is always the last resort. We're trying to make it work with wherever you're at first and foremost. And ideally you make it work and you figure it out with our help versus us having to call the coach. But of course, sometimes we have to do that as well. All right. Perfect. Uh, that's all the questions I've got for now. So I hope some of you guys aren't too scared and can ask some questions. So, Whenever you guys, uh, whoever, just unmute your mic and, and ask away, please. Uh, I have a question. What's the difference between an advisor and an agent? Yeah, so the difference is really gets into, it's all around the NCAA and what your agent or advisor can and can't do for you. You know, a lot of guys are both agents and advisors but you know so the ncaa bylaws state you know you can't be getting things for free you can't get sponsorships you can't get endorsements and so it, it really gets into that side of it that you know if you're going that ncaa route an advisor isn't allowed to assist you with you know he's still able to have the same relationship with you as a player you, know, you can still reach out to ncaa programs or bchl programs and that's a process that all of those teams are very familiar with but it really gets into the the endorsements side of things, the receiving benefits that you can't, the NCAA says you can't receive. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. No, no problem. What do you think are the main factors that choose major midget or CSHO? Um, I would say what's the development plan for the the two programs you're looking at, what's the opportunity going to be? It's like we were getting, we were talking about before with say mid, midget prep versus elite 15. It, you know, part of developing is you need to play. It doesn't mean you need to be first line, first unit power play, but you got to be playing a regular shift. And if one of those teams offers you a, a much larger opportunity to play, you know, I think that's definitely a factor. And then it's the development. I mean, as I said earlier, you know, we really tried to help our players with their development of course your parents want to support you with that but your coach is who you're with every day and so what's their plan to not and not just what's their plan to generally to develop the players but what's their plan to help you develop and to help you get better 
and like I said, part of that's playing time, but part of that's everything else, the practices and the support and everything. So that's how, that's what we try to help our players figure out is what's going to, which route is going to help them take that next step. And again, it's specific to them. Uh, what's the difference between like, a, like only a, like NCAA advisor, like agency, like re than a regular, like regular agency compared to like only an NCAA one? Yeah, I think some, yeah, there are some agencies or advisors who are really end up becoming more WHL focused or more NCAA focused. And, you know, I don't think there's, it just depends for you what you're trying to do. If you really want to have both options open, you know, I would definitely recommend working with somebody who has experience helping players go both paths, but it's, I don't think there's any major differences. It's just their area of specialty, right? It's like a defensive coach versus a forward coach. They're both forwards, but obviously they have a, or they're sorry, they're both coaches, but they have a different piece that they focus on. And so it's, but there's plenty of guys and I would say most guys tend to, to do both and you, but you will see these NCAA focused ones once in a while as well. I have another question. Um, what, uh, do you think there's a lot of benefits with having an agent this young or do you think it's better to wait? Yeah, I think it's different for every player. And I would say if you're looking at an agent, it, you should be looking at the same factors as, you know, if you're looking for a team to join or an academy to join, it's like, how is this person going to help me reach my goals? And if an agency is able to really help you with the things that you have going on right now, then yeah, I think there's value in that, but it's just, there's no, honestly, there's no right answer on that. You know, obviously I'm biased. I think that agents and advisors can help a lot. It can help you early on, but it, you've got to be comfortable with it. But what I will say at this age is, you know, with these Western League teams, I mean, they're, right, if you're, if they're committing to you, they're putting a contract in front of you, right? And so I think there's absolutely a benefit to have somebody who's able to just help you walk through that process and understand that. Thank you. Is that it? Anybody else? Nothing? All right. Well, James, I, I really appreciate this. Um, you know, I see you, you're in the rank a lot. So, so you're a hardworking guy. So these guys will recognize you now when you're, you're at BWC or around the rink. And I really appreciate you taking this call on and answering our questions. Yeah, no problem. Leland. And yeah, if any of you guys do have any questions that come up afterwards i mean whether through leland or whatever don't ever hesitate to reach out happy to answer any questions you guys have all right thanks guys thanks james have a good day thank, you. Thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you